Thank you, Dr. Moore, Cindy Blaisdale on the piano. Wow. Something about... Alexander Solzhenitsyn said in his commencement address at Harvard, 1980, predicted a day would come when maybe truth and goodness couldn't reach us. Here we are in postmodernity. He said, if that day comes, beauty will still find its way into our souls. It just has that power through music, through voice, through these words. I mean, every time I hear that last verse of love so amazing, so divine, demands my heart, my soul, my life. Ah, what a beautiful hymn. So wonderful. Well, our next guest, we had RHB in the morning. We got JMC in the afternoon. He's come from the West Coast. He isn't feeling great. He has powered through it. I'm so impressed that he has powered through it to be here with us. If you don't know John Mark Comer, which is weird because he's well known, he is doing amazing stuff. But John Mark Comer uh, is a New York Times best-selling author of Live No Lies and The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, as well as four other books. He's done amazing work. He's, he's practicing the way I think will lead us into the future of the next wave of what Formation is doing. Uh, he, is, he is at the forefront of that. He's one of the great, bright, young leaders in Formation. He's a person of integrity. Uh, the more I get to know him, the more I'm just astounded at who he is and what he does. This afternoon, he really gained a special place in my heart when we were talking, and I talked about an experience back in the day, and I said, well, that was a day when I had pretty cool hair. <laughs> and John Mark said, oh, but you're good bald. You know, they're sad bald. <laughs> but you're cool bald. I'm going to get a tattoo. <laughs> it says cool bald, J-M-C. John Mark Comer is in the house. Let's give him a welcome. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Great to see you. I'm just going to not comment on that. I'm going to pretend like I, I have deniability. Who knows if I said that or not? Because all of the sad, bald people hate me right now. And the trouble with that is we all know who you are, too. It's so sad. And so there's, just, there's no way to climb out of that hole. So thank you for that horrible introduction, Dr. Smith. <laughs> no, I am feeling out of the weather, but I'm so happy to be here. Um, I, uh, I said yes to this invitation, not as a speaking engagement. I actually am stopping all of that pretty much, but because I wanted to come and learn with you. And I think the world of Dr. Smith and of so many of the people at this event and who are in this ecosystem. So I'm here more as a learner than a teacher, but if you teach, they pay for your airfare and it doesn't cost you any money. <laughs> so I have to do this bit, and then I get to go back to asking him questions. So all good. Um, I called Dr. Smith last week and I said, what, what do you want me to talk about? And he said, Dallas used to, Dallas? Sorry, I, my voice is bad, I'm sorry. Um, he said, Dallas used to have this line, serve what you're cooking. I have no idea what that means, but I took it to mean talk about whatever it is I'm working on and thinking about. Is that what it, it's too late now if not. <laughs> so I took it to mean that. So let me talk with you a little bit about kind of um, the work I'm on about in the world and where I think, where I see it fitting in the larger movement that you and I are a part of. Please turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 20. Um, Acts chapter 20. And let's start off by reading from verse 28. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. 
I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. It's an open secret that we are living through a crisis of discipleship in the Western church. Name your malaise, and we have plenty to choose from. Political polarization and the way that, quote, Christians are getting sucked into the vitriol of the culture wars on left and right and are showing far more allegiance to an idolatrous idolatry, again, uh, idolatrous uh, ideology, again, on the left and on the right, than to the teachings and the way of Jesus. The breakdown of the church, people just not coming back to church post-COVID, the phenomenon, the epidemic of deconstruction amongst people my age and kind of a few years either side, the way that the sex revolution has so deeply infiltrated the church and the teachings of Jesus on sexuality are being rapidly abandoned by even an increasing number of Christian leaders. The litany of celebrity pastor scandals. I mean, we could just go on and on. But all of these are symptoms. None of them are really the root problem. The root problem is, is even worse, so to speak. You know, as far back as the 1970s, Robert Lovelace famously called it the sanctification gap in evangelicalism. This cognitive dissonance between what we say we believe and how we actually live. Now, all people have a modicum of cognitive dissonance. There's never been a Christian that hasn't had a gap between their implicit knowledge in their body and their explicit knowledge in their head, between what they say they believe about God and how they actually live. All of us have a gap. But at some point, that gap is so chasmic, there is no way to explain it away graciously. The need, something about the American template for even church itself doesn't seem to produce the level of spiritual maturity that we all ache for, that most pastors ache for, and certainly most people ache for. The need is for spiritual formation in the language of this tribe, for pastors and people to be formed in their inner woman or man into the person of Jesus. It comes as no surprise that the formation movement kind of comes to rebirth in the Western Protestant stream of the church in the late 70s as somewhat of a crisis to the superficiality and the ineffectiveness of discipleship in evangelicalism. Alan Fadlane, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with his work, spiritual director and writer out of Southern California, uh, he's likely been here before, I don't know, does great work. I was having lunch with him once. This was many years ago. And I had been the pastor of a mega church and had discovered uh, the writings of, of Dallas Willard, who was like my gateway drug. And since I'm from California, I have to clarify that's a metaphor, not literal. Um, and I was just drinking out of a fire hose. It was, I was reading all Dr. Smith stuff and I was reading all the things and it was transformative. It was uh, scary because I'd been through Bible college and seminary. I graduated with the Latin words after my name that I still can't pronounce. And still 80% of what I was learning was brand new information to me. And I was, it was dawning on me that the way our church was set up, it was not designed for this kind of growth of the soul. Like there was a, an architectural problem that I was facing. So I started searching around, All right, these books are amazing, these practices are amazing, these podcasts are amazing, the teachings are amazing, but what does this actually look like in a church? Like when you actually attempt to integrate this into the life of a community in a place and in a time, and now we're living through the digital revolution and all of that. And so I was just going around having lunch with people. Do you know anybody doing anything? Do you know of anybody doing anything? And the answer was almost always no, but here's a great book to read. And the books were great. But I was like, all right, how, how do I get that into the life of our church? So sat down with Alan. And like Dr. Smith, he's been 
kind of in the ecosystem since the inception of this movement. And he gave me this paradigm, uh, which I don't know, you may agree with this. Some of you have been, been in this movement the whole time. I'm a newcomer to it. You may disagree with it. But his paradigm was the formation movement in three waves. Wave one was a few books, in particular, Celebration of Disciplines, 1978. And we stand in the legacy of that right here in this building. Spirit of the Disciplines, a number of years after that. And these two books, in many ways, which again, counterbalance to evangelicalism, the rise of the megachurch, the church growth movement, the seeker-sensitive movement, this beautiful counterbalance. Wave two is what he called nonprofit. So you have Renovari and these other beautiful ministries that begin to gather people together around these ideas, best practices. You begin to have it infiltrate higher education and you have programs like the one here that are stupendous. And then wave three, he said, is some churches, um, but wave two was all, he said, outside the local church. So it was through a conference or a cohort or a nonprofit or an academic institution. It was rarely, if ever, through like a, a group of people in wherever. Wave three, he said, was some churches would bring on a spiritual formation person on their staff. A bunch of you are in the room. And he said most of the time it was just a rebrand of their small groups pastor um, or their family life pastor. But he said occasionally... It was someone who was doing this kind of work, whether that was spiritual retreats or spiritual direction or training spiritual directors or inner healing prayer or teaching on the disciplines or whatever, broad category. But he said that at that point, you're into a slim, 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 low single digits percentage. And in almost all of those churches, it's on the periphery, not at the center. Nothing was ever done to integrate it into the center of the church. So we're sitting there having lunch um, at this little vegan place. Don't hold the vegan against me, those of you from the Midwest. You don't even know what that is, so it doesn't matter. Never mind. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> sitting having this lunch, and I was like, okay. I was literally taking notes. It's like, so when was wave four? When like all of these pastors woke up to the reality that how the traditional American church is set up is it's it's not designed to produce a high level of spiritual formation and began to take all these amazing ideas and write a curriculum for Christ likeness and beta test it and how does it work with the iPhone and the digital age and millennials and progressives and urban and all the stuff, and he just he just looked at me and he literally shrugged his shoulders and said it, it never happened, and you know I don't know if this is true. Dr. Smith can come up and and rebuke everything that I just said. So I have this third hand. He said that apparently Willard on his deathbed said if this does not make it into the local church, it will be nothing more than a fad um, because the only institution that will be around a thousand years from now is the Church of Jesus. Not Renovari, not practicing what the way, not the, I mean, unless if you go British, Oxford has been around for quite a while, but <laughs> the odds are not in our favor, you know? Maybe, maybe the Apprentice Institute will, but. That, that's what will still be here. And so this has to happen. The word fad is a very fitting word. I would argue the fad's already over. On one hand, there's more hunger and thirst for this than there's ever been. On the other hand, it has still, it's aging out. And you still hear precious little to no talk about, about this kind of stuff from people who are the up and coming leaders in our country and far beyond. So I believe that it's time for a fourth wave, for a, a number of practitioners to take this incredible body of learning from the last 40 years, this deep well that I have been drinking from, continue to drink from, and will drink from until the day I die, and then attempt to figure out, all right, how do we integrate this? How do we move beyond sermons where we quote Willard and, uh, or Dr. Smith, or whoever, or uh, RBJ, as she apparently is now. Um, no, not RBJ, that's the other one, sorry. It's practically the same awesomeness, you know. Uh, how, how do we move to, like, actually integrate this into the life of the church? So that's what I'm working on. That's what I'm giving this, at least next season, if not the rest of my life, to. And uh, we've started this little organization called Practicing the Way 
which is our attempt at a curriculum for Christlikeness. The original title actually was Curriculum for Christlikeness. I have all these documents on my laptop that are titled CFC for short. It was our attempt to take Willard's idea and write this, but specifically we're in Portland, Oregon with a church of, you know, average age is 28 years old. This is a hyper, the, the most liberal city, I think, in the in, at least in all of North America, more liberal than LA, more liberal than New York super secular, incredibly corrosive to anything remotely resembling Christian orthodoxy. How, how do we do this here, right? So that's what I have spent many years working on, and now we've kind of turned it into an organization to attempt to serve the church at large. And our proposal to the churches that we work with is that a beginning, um, a right step in, the, in a good direction, not the answer, but a answer, not the path, but a step forward on the path, is for churches to re-architect their life together around what ancient Christians called a rule of life. You are likely very familiar with this language. Um, if you're new to the conversation, we just define a rule of life as a schedule and a set of practices and relational rhythms that organize our lives around the three goals of an apprentice of Jesus, to be with him, to become like him, and to do as he did. And I was in a conversation with John Ortberg recently, who's a very much a, a mentor and a gift to all of us. And um, I lamented to him in my little angsty millennial kind of way, how sad it is that, as I'm learning about this, that historically most churches had not one rule but two rules. They had the rule of faith, beginning with the New Testament, this, and then they had the rule of life. And the rule of faith was essentially you know, orthodoxy and the great tradition, whatever you want to call it, what we believe. And most churches today still have a rule of faith. They call it a statement of faith or a doctrinal statement, but I would imagine pretty much any church represented in this room or in most of the English-speaking world, you go to their website, and there will be some page there somewhere that says what we believe, and you will click on it, and it will give a list of the core Christian doctrines of Trinity and incarnation and death and resurrection and the pre-tribulational rapture, you know, the, the key Christian stuff. Um, it, will, it will have a... <laughs> So sarcasm, it's a West Coast thing. I, I always forget in the Midwest, you're godlier than we are. And so don't laugh at that. Um, but it will have a list of the core Christian doctrines, the ideas about reality by which we navigate reality. And this is of utmost importance. But almost zero churches will have next to it a page that's how we live with a list of the core Christian practices, core Christian, and not just spiritual disciplines like, you know, Sabbath or solitude or generosity, but Sermon on the Mount kind of practices. We love our enemies. We forgive those who wrong us. We fight actively against materialism and the God of money. We fight off worry and attempt to release our attachments to God and deeply trust in Him. We don't judge people or show contempt toward those we disagree with. We stay faithful to our spouses. We fight off anger in our heart and we work toward pure speech. I mean, pick your example. That, almost none of us have that. And, uh, and I said to John, it's so sad that churches don't have a rule of life anymore. And in his very not angsty, mature, proof that spiritual formation works way, John immediately cut me off and he said, no, they do. He said pretty much, in fact, he said pretty much every evangelical church I've ever seen has the exact same one. It's four things. Come to church on Sunday, join a small group, serve, and give. Then he said this in a not angry way. He said, the problem is that isn't a rule of life designed to form somebody into spiritual maturity. It's designed to run a local church. Now, I'm a pastor. I'm like, I'm cut to the heart. This is, uh, we had five, not four at our church. Our five were practice the way of Jesus live in community, gather on Sundays, serve and give. <laughs> so all we did was we added, oh yeah, follow Jesus, which by the way, it took us 15 years to add that. <laughs> and, we, and we put community before Sunday as like a kind of little judo move. That's all we did <laughs> to the whole thing. Now, by John's logic, we do have a rule of life. Our church has a rule of life, so does yours. If he's right, and I think he is, then follow his logic to the next step. 
That means when it comes to the crisis of discipleship in the Western church or in our own life, our own stuckness in our growth, the problem isn't that our rule of life isn't working, it's that it is. You know, Willard used to love to quote that line from the business guru. I'm spacing on his name right now, but you know, your system is perfectly designed to give you the results you are getting, which was originally intended to apply to like a spreadsheet at a widget factory. But if you were to think that through, not that people aren't widgets, spiritual formation is certainly not an assembly line. There's no curriculum for Christ likeness. And if you hack it, you put people through the system and three years later, they're just Dallas Willard <laughs> or whatever. That doesn't exist, but we all have some kind of a system or a structure that our churches are built around and that our individual lives are built around. It may be conscious or unconscious. It may be intentional or haphazard. It may be transformational or the opposite. But the question is not, do you have a rule? It's, do you know what it is because you all have a rule, I have one, and is it working? Is it forming you and your community into higher and higher levels of spiritual maturity or not? John called uh, the search for a transformational way of life the holy grail of our time. The time is ripe to reimagine a rule of life for the modern era, a rule of Benedict, so to speak, but about 10% of the, you know, seriousness, because that's too much. I'm sorry, it's just too much. I love it at a conceptual level, but let me sleep in in the morning, all right? <laughs> the time is ripe to reimagine this. There is a hunger, there is an openness, in particular from church leaders, who there's often been this great tension between established leaders at healthy or established churches and people that are passionate about spiritual formation, because there is a legitimate tension between the two. But in a post-COVID world, post-2016 election world, the old system is breaking down. And most pastors' experience is that every year is more work and less return. And you can only do that for so long before you either burn out, flame out, dip out, or you try something new. And so there's an, there's an openness to something new amongst pastors um, from widely different traditions in parts of the country that I've never seen before in my lifetime. So a rule of life is our proposal, not as the path forward, but a path forward. And for the church, you know, this tiny little, it feels way bigger than it really is if you're in a room like this, but this resurgence, this micro-resurgence in rule of life that, is, that we're a part of, that I'm a part of, that we're, that's happening right now, is pretty much all being run through the grid of Western-style radical individualism with individual people writing their rule of life. Now, I'm not against that. I think it's a good thing, not a bad thing, because we already have a rule, and so this is just more intentionality. I'm all for it. But historically, as you all know, there doesn't exist a rule of life for an individual. Rule of lives were written for communities. They were designed to hold a community together around shared rhythms of spiritual formation. So that as a, because spiritual formation is a communal experience or it is not formation at all. So that as a community together goes on this spiritual journey, they are over time formed into the way of Jesus. Andy Crouch and the crew at Praxis out of New York are one of the only Protestant groups I know that have designed a rule of life for a community. Theirs is contextualized for what they call redemptive entrepreneurs, not for a church. But they define, or Andy defines, a rule as a set of practices to guard our habits and guide our lives. I love that. I want to explore that with you. To guard our habits and guide our lives. I like that framework, guarding and guiding because it fits so well with the word picture of a rule of life. I'm, you know, I'm not gonna give you the sermon because you all could likely preach it, but you know, rule, regula, the Latin word, is, literally means a straight piece of wood, but it was likely the word used for a trellis in a winery in the ancient Mediterranean. John 15, Jesus' most in-depth teaching on spiritual formation. How do we bear fruit? We abide in the vine. So the early Christians picked this word picture up and said, all right, if this is the word picture, if this is the how, the process of formation, um, a, a, a vine needs a trellis. It needs some kind of a support structure to lift it up the, off the ground, open it to the light, and index its growth in the right direction. Otherwise, if it's just left to 
grow wild on the ground, it will bear a fraction of the fruit that it is capable of, if any at all, because it's so vulnerable to damage, disease, wild animals. So in the same way, we need some kind of a trellis, some kind of a support structure to kind of open our life up to grace and to the formation of Jesus. And so they came up with this concept of a regular or a rule of life. And if you think about this metaphor, you know, in John 15, there's the gardener in the metaphor, not just the vine and the branch. What's the job of a gardener or a horticulturist, I think is the word? Um, essentially, it's to tend the plants and keep out the weeds, you know, to put certain things in, good soil, light, water, oxygen, nutrients, and then to keep other things out, weeds, disease, bacteria, wild animals. That's very similar to this concept of guarding and guiding, which is very similar to the job of a pastor. That's why I read to you from this passage here in Acts chapter 20. You can look again at verse 28. This is, you know, of course, Paul to the elders or the leaders. And elders may have been a much less formal role than it is in our churches today. It may have just been, meant the people like you, the kind of literal elders, some of you in the room, some of those that are a little older, a little wiser, a little grayer, or balder, you know? Um, <laughs> who have this, this fatherly and this motherly role in the family of God, the, imp the imposition here in verse 28 is keep watch over yourselves and all of the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseer. So here's the imagery is of like, you know, King David who's watching out for the flock at night for predators or thieves or wild animals. Be shepherds or pastors of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. It's his, not ours. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and not spare the flock. Notice, will come. Not it's highly likely, not may, not there's a 20% chance. In his mind, there's a 100% chance. Savage wolves will come in and decimate the heart of the flock of God. Even from your own number, men in this very room, women in this very room, men will arise and distort the truth. Notice, not deny the truth, distort the truth. All the best false teachings are distortion of what is true, not denial of what is true. They get so much farther. In order to draw away disciples or apprentices after them, people who end up being more formed to be like the wolf than like the shepherd. So, and here's his point, be on your guard. There are two basic commands that Paul has to the mothers and the fathers of the family of God, many of which are in the room right here. Guard and guide, like guide your people, shepherd them, pastor them, direct them into the way, and guard them from all that would decimate the life of the soul. Now, I understand that not all of you are in church leadership, that it's about 50-50 or so is best guess. And so forgive me, I don't want to just talk to half of the room, and so go easy on me. But again, what was the saying? Uh, serve what you're cooking. This is where I'm living right now, and I just want to offer it to you. Whether you're in a pastoral role or not, or becoming a mother or a father in the family or not, I just want to pass on what I'm learning for you. Here's my question for the rest of our time. As we think about a rule of life for our own life, for our communities, for those that we pastor and serve, what does our rule need to guard people from and guard our own lives from? And what does our rule need to guide people into? and guide our own lives into? There's no right answer to this, um, but let me just offer you three things that I think we need to guard against, and then three counter practices that I think we need to guide into. The first one, and I am new here, and so uh, I have no clue what landmines I'm about to step on. I have no idea if I am preaching to the choir or I'm about to incite a protest and I'm so sorry, um, in advance. Uh, so I'm just going to say this as, as graciously as I know how, but as boldly as I know how. We need to guard against the widespread drift in the spiritual formation movement toward progressivism. And by progressivism here, I mean theological progressivism, not sociopolitical. So I'm not referring at all to whether or not the government should pay for college tuition but to issues of the body, sexuality, gender, marriage, the nature of relationships, the nature of scripture, its authority or not. These are not side issues. 
These are not agree to disagree. This, these are not some Christians think this, other Christians think that. No, this is orthodoxy. This is, you can safely say, 2,000 years after the fact, Christians believe this. Christians do not believe that. We are on very safe ground to say that. And I single out progressivism not because I don't believe there are dangers to the church on both end of ends of the culture war. I 1,000% do. I single it out because the kind of people that skew more alt-right just don't seem drawn to spiritual formation in the same way. Um, you know, they're like, yeah, there's not as a high value for, like, kindness and stuff. <laughs> Whereas I'm seeing an alarming number of people in the formation space drift from the teachings of Jesus, in particular around human sexuality. And I don't think there's one reason for this. I think there's different reasons for different people. There's normally multiple reasons. I think it has something to do, though, with the fact that people often feel they have to go outside of the church to really grow into maturity. Most of our churches do really good at discipleship in the early ages of the spiritual formation journey, and then it just falls off a cliff. So once people kind of get more or closer to that second half, they begin to have to look outside of the church to a spiritual director or a therapist or a program or a retreat. And that's not all bad, but often they step outside of healthy authority structures that leave them vulnerable to drift. I think it also has something to do with wounding. Um, for most of us, pain is the catalyst to go on what you could call the inner journey. And in particular, for a lot of pastors and leaders, it's often pain that is related to a church experience and often pain that's related to a church that is resistant to some of the best learnings of the formation world. And pain, as we both know, is, is, as we all know, is both the entry point for Jesus to form us and the entry point for the enemy to malform us. It goes one of two ways. Whatever the cause of the vulnerability, it seems that this progressive wave is, is just, it's just like a cancer that is eating into this movement in the church. And it will, no doubt, like a cancer, kill every church that it touches. And a bunch of you will disagree with me. But we have so much historical data to elevate this claim from my opinion to near fact. Rodney Stark, Dr. Smith and I were just chatting about this, and Roger Fink in their book, The Churching of America, academic read, you don't need to read it, very influential in my thinking, offer kind of a 30,000 foot view of America's kind of history of religion, history, history of Christianity in, in America. The book comes to a number of counterintuitive conclusions such as they argue the most post-Christian and secular America ever was, was at its founding. They date the peak of secularism to 1776, argue that the founding of the country, only one in five Americans had anything resembling Christian faith or involvement in a church. And they argue the peak of Christendom was in the late 50s and early 60s. It was after World War II that the giant wave, America was more Christian then than ever. They also conclude that the most post-Christian secular part of the country was the South, and the most Christendized part of the country was the Northeast for basically the first half of the country's life, which actually makes a lot of sense of slavery and all sorts of other issues, but it's the opposite today, right? Anyway, it's just this kind of honestly dry academic survey from you know, one of the world-renowned sociologists we have, Rodney Stark, and at the end, they basically draw some academic, non-polemic, non-moral conclusions. They're not pastors, they have, they have no cat, it's just a sociological survey. And they basically say at the end, listen, we now have over 250 years of history since German higher criticism, which is basically the beginning of what we today would call theological progressivism. And we can now safely conclude that liberal churches die and conservative churches flourish. And by conservative, they don't mean what that word means now. They don't mean Trumpian or Republican. They mean orthodox, robust, discipleship-oriented churches that call people and require people to live differently than the host culture, that call people to a different way of life, not just Christianize the one they already have. And they argue those are the churches that grow. And even if you mine through all the incredibly depressing data on the decline of the church in America, the one little bright spark, there's basically two bright spots, Pentecostals who aren't white, yeah, I got one up. 
and churches with a high value for discipleship and Christian orthodoxy. That's, those are basically the bright spots. That's where the, that's where the hope is, you know? That's re- immigrants who believe in the Holy Spirit <laughs> and people that believe in robust discipleship to Jesus. And, you know, there is, in spite of all this evidence, so many people I know who are not bad people, good people, genuine people, smart people, educated people, who seem to genuinely believe that progressivism is the future and that the church must adapt or die. And I'm telling you, I'm from the future. I'm from the most liberal city in America. It is not the future. I'm telling you, and if you don't believe me, whenever I meet a pastor who is questioning Jesus' teachings on sexuality, I say, please come spend a couple days downtown in Portland. Walk around, walk around. It's the number one city for more people identify as non-binary, transgender, important than any other city in the world. Please come, please walk around and just prayer walk for three days before you make any decision. And tell me if this is the creator's design for joyful relational flourishing or not. I'm telling you, it is not the future. I could not name a single healthy progressive church or Christian. And that will make so many of you mad. Maybe, maybe not. Or it will make you mad in the opposite way. Either way, I'm doing bad damage to you. And I will never get invited back. (laughs) My point is, please, this is not the path to life. And it is incumbent on us as a generation to hold the line in kindness, not to repeat the mistakes. We're living in a very similar moment to the split between the liberals and the fundamentalists 100 years ago. And the, the, the more orthodox Christians made a huge mistake in throwing the baby out with the bathwater and a number of things that the mainline denominations emphasize, namely social justice, the role of inner feelings, and Jesus as an ethical teacher, almost they developed an allergic reaction to. And so they threw out these very things that then became almost the seed of the demise of evangelicalism. We cannot make the same mistake. We must have a heart of humility, compassion, curiosity, but also a heart of courage and a boldness to hold the line. Secondly, I believe that we need to guard against radical individualism. The professor Robert Bellaw coined that that phrase, and it's based on his team's research. They argue it is the defining trait of America. One of the drivers, I think, behind the formation movement to drift from orthodoxy is its simultaneous drift away from the church. Again, much of that is on the church. It's on people like me on pastors, but the rise of the post-church spiritual director directee relationship, which similar to the way that many therapists have replaced multi-generational families and grandmas and grandpas and village life, spiritual directors have replaced much of Christian community. This is not a statement against spiritual direction. I give it, I receive it, I believe in it, nor is it it's certainly not a case against therapy. I've been in it for 13 years, shocking, I know. <laughs> Apparently, it doesn't work as well as they say, but this, <laughs> this is me transformed, people, all right? This is bad news. We, we do not all start from the same place, all right? Oh, so it's not a statement against direction or therapy. I'm so pro the good version of that to the, the core of my being. It's a statement against the atomization of Western life. And so what he's, the enemy is always at work. You know, this is Willard in Renovation of the Heart. He's always at work on ideas to denude them over time, right? It's why there's almost no historic denominations or church movements that have kept vibrancy or even kept orthodoxy. The enemy is just there to wear down the edge that was the original edge of the Spirit of Jesus. And one of the ways I see that happening in the formation movement is so easily co-opted by just the Western individual project self, self self-actualization, project me thing. And it so quickly just becomes a Christianized version of Philip Reif's, you know, Philip Reif's The Therapeutic Man kind of era that we're living through in history. The third thing I believe we need to guard against is hurry. I have basically built a whole ministry off a line that isn't even from me. It's from Dallas. Uh, You must ruthlessly eliminate hurry from your life. But I keep coming back to... Uh, My therapist, who's this 70-something PhD, brilliant, brilliant man. And before we began to attempt our curriculum for Christlikeness with our church, and we called it Practicing the Way, integrate this into our church, it's a five-year journey, a kind of experience. Before we ever started, we were doing all this beta testing, and we come up with this working theory of change, 
And so I wanted to meet with him, not for a therapy session. I just wanted to share the whole thing with him and then just get him to poke holes in it. And it was a really helpful meeting. But the main takeaway, he basically kind of liked what we were about to do. But then he said, said this. He said, the number one problem you will face is time. And then he said this based on half a century of experience as a therapist. He said, people are just too busy to have any kind of deep emotional life and spiritual growth at all. And, you know, Willard said the primary human failing is to desire to do the good, but then fail at the necessary planning, discipline, and perseverance required to follow through. The road to hell is paved with good intentions, as the saying goes. Cue all the stats on New Year's resolutions, proof in kind. And so we have to find ways to slow down. Because this work, this work of the soul, the soul has its own pace, and it does not go at Wi-Fi, Silicon Valley speed. One of the reasons that people are so busy and so exhausted and so stressed out and so burned out that they have no time or space or energy for a process that is by design slow, uncontrollable, non-linear, inefficient, deeply relational, non-pragmatic, welcome to the spiritual journey does not fit well in formulas, programs, all, it doesn't. So we have to have, what are the spiritual disciplines? They're mostly just ways to slow down and give God space and time. So three dangers we as a generation of pastors need to guard against, progressivism, individualism, and hurry, which is a natural segue. I don't see a clock, I'm probably going over. I'm gonna do my very best, Dr. Smith, to make this short. Three counter practices that I think we need to guide people into. So we need to guard against hurry and guide people into what, you know, Scazzaro calls a slow down spirituality. Pastoring your church or your own life into some kind of a rule of life for the modern era will likely begin with disciplines of not doing, not of doing, of what, you know, many have called abstinence, not engagement of subtraction, not addition, not of asking people to do more, but asking people to do less. There's a line in Nowen's book, Way of the Heart, which of course is written to pastors and church leaders. He just has this stunning line I, I come back to. It's given shape to much of my philosophy of ministry. He writes, the question that must guide all organizing activity in a parish is not how to keep people busy, but how to keep them from being so busy that they can no longer hear the voice of God who speaks in silence. What if our churches, which often just pour gas on the fire of what you know, Ruth calls Christian busyness, um, what if instead they were places that if you were to take them seriously would train you and teach you to slow your life down to the pace of Jesus? Secondly, we need to guard against individualism and guide people into community. My favorite book on community is When the Church Was a Family by Dr. Joseph Hellerman out in L.A. Here's the key line. Spiritual formation occurs primarily in the context of community. People who remain contented with their brothers and sisters in the local church almost in invariably grow in self-understanding, and they mature in their ability to relate in healthy ways to God and to their fellow human beings. This is especially the case for those courageous Christians who stick it out through the often messy process of interpersonal discord and conflict resolution. Long-term interpersonal relationships are the crucible of genuine progress in the Christian life. People who stay grow. This is what Dr. Todd Hall calls relational spirituality. If you're not familiar with his work, I think it's the most important contribution to this conversation in a long time. Um, his new book is called Relational Spirituality. He argues from a wide variety of disciplines that we are primarily relational beings, that the telos of the spiritual journey is what he calls loving presence to God and others, and that spiritual formation or discipleship is by design a relational process by which we are, in his language, loved into loving. This places both the relational experience of God, not just in Paul's language, knowledge about God, but knowledge of God, so more contemplative spirituality, and a relational experience of Christian community at the center of all transformation. The question we must ask is how do we find ways of being together 
that foster this kind of relational growth? Because the honest answer is, unless if your church is very small, Sunday is not the answer. And an even more depressing answer is, unless if your small group is very different than most small groups, your small group's likely not the answer, depending on how it is set up. There is a growing body of research from the social scientists um, that has all sorts of implications, I think, for how we design our churches, how we do the work of formation, that basically groups relationships into different types and different functions and different sizes. All of them have a numerical cap. So uh, most theories land somewhere like this one. This is one of the most widely respected. I'm sure you're somewhat familiar with it. Robin Dunbar is an evolutionary psychologist out of Oxford. And his principle is basically in three or four categories. We have one to five intimates. These are the people that know you deeply, that in Jung's category know your full shadow, know you as you actually are, and they love you and they accept you and you feel safe with them. In a dream world, this would be your spouse and one or two of your best friends and a, a director or a therapist or a mentor or somebody like that or parent. Then we have about 15 friends. These are the people you do life around a table with. You do the one another's of the New Testament with because some of them can be a little annoying. So you bear one another, and, and like you and me, uh, we can be a little annoying. So you bear one another's burdens and you pay each other's bills and you help parent each other's kids and you go on vacation together and you grieve together and you bring meals when somebody has a baby or somebody diagnosed with cancer. These are the people that, this is your, your kind of de facto family, your kinship group. Then Dunbar's next threshold that he's most famous for is around 150 or so. This, he would argue, is the maximum number of people that we can actually have a relationship with. Um, this is now referred, it's been data tested so many times, scientists call it Dunbar's principle or the law of 150, because it seems to be the optimal grouping size for human community. Beyond this are what he would call a tribe. Uh, which is, this is everything from like the Democratic Party to many of our churches to, um, you know, or a sports team or whatever, these larger kind of groups or tribes that we get identity and vision and a sense of forward motion from. Now, there's a lot, of, a lot that we can learn from this body of research, but the two like very salient implications, all of that to say was to say this, and I'm channeling the work of Todd Hall and many others, um, that we need relationships across all four levels. So it's a mistake to think that if a relationship isn't deep and intimate, you can't be vulnerable, it's not healthy. Um, no, we, need, we actually need relationships across all four of these categories, uh, which means the goal of a church is not to get every relationship into that deep one. Because again, you can only do that with three, four, five people. If you're introverted like me, two, three people. You definitely do not want this with my whole church. Not... <laughs> at all, it would be exhausting. Um, but secondly, our deepest formation, growth, healing, stretching, purgation, it all happens in those first two layers. That doesn't mean that the larger layers, which is most of our Sunday experience, are not helpful or good or even crucial. It just means that the really good stuff tends to happen around tables, not around stages. It tends to happen in places where people know your middle name and they know your story and they know your trauma or they know that you have yet to know your own trauma and, or whatever it is, they know you. That's where the good stuff goes. We need to guide people and our own bodies to deep relationships, vulnerability, emotional attunement, confession of sin, listening to one another. I mean, confession. We could do a whole thing on the lost power of confession since the Reformation, which I more and more think is the pathway by which we grow. We name the reality of where we are in the presence of the love of God and a loving brother or sister. I remember chatting to Orberg about this and he said the way that most evangelicals or reformed or Protestant people do confession is however often at church they file forward to receive the bread and the cup and they say sorry to God in the quiet of their minds. Or if they're Anglican, they have a liturgy. We've sinned against you in word and deed or whatever. And he said that's fine. But he said the confession that James is talking about, that John is talking about, is much more like an AA when you go down to a basement and you sit there in like broad fluorescent lighting and it's like that, the bad church basement smell. 
And, uh, and, and you say, hi, my name is you know, Bob or whatever. I'm an alcoholic. I was dry, and then last Thursday night, I went on a binge. I made out with a woman. My wife's moved out of the house. My life's falling apart. Help. That's confession. And he said, that has a power to set people free. That saying sorry to God in an individualized, privatized, secret way, not a bad thing, just does not have that power. But who are you going to do that with? I think it's one of the main reasons people seek out therapy. They're trying to find a way to confess their sin, even if they don't even use those words or believe in those categories. We all have it. We have to share our shame with another because we all live with this shame. We have to get out from under it. It's the cause of sin as much as it is the after effect of sin. We have to find ways to be together where we're emotionally available. We confess our sins. We do life together. That's where the good stuff happens. And then very quickly to end. Third, we need to guard against progressivism and guide people into the quiet. This may sound like a radical leap or an illogical link, but hear me out. I think that one of the driving reasons that so many people are walking away from the faith is because they are being constantly formed or really deformed by the digital IV, by the, the, the algorithms of Silicon Valley on the left or on the right that are consuming their mind and beginning to completely distort their view of reality. It is so loud, not just the noise of living in a city and noise pollution and all the science behind that, which is a real deal, but the noise of opinion and information and, and vitriol and anger and moralizing and ideology, this noise that is a constant assault on our minds through our phones or most people's phones. We are so, so numbed by these other voices that we rarely hear the voice of God. As Rollheiser said, we are distracting ourselves into spiritual oblivion. And I deeply believe that one of the main tasks, in particular at a pastoral level of our era, is to slow people down and to help people come to quiet before God and before one another. This is where I think the world's actually far ahead of us, you know, with the explosion of mindfulness apps and headspace and guided meditations and secularized yoga. I mean, People are trying to find a way to calm the chaos of their mind. And the reality is we have thousands of years of this extraordinary tradition called prayer. <laughs> That's so much better than all of it. And it doesn't cost $79 for one class. You don't have to be rich and wear Lululemon pants to do it. <laughs> you can like just go for it. It's amazing. But most of us don't know what to do with our minds in prayer. We need a little help. We need a little training. We need a little teaching and how to come to quiet before God. And that's where you come in. And the work that you do is so important. So um, I offer you everything. I intentionally did not exegete a passage. I'm not here to tell you truth with a capital T. Those are my convictions. I, I deeply stand by them and believe in them, though I'm open to push back at every level. But you are doing such good and important work. And it's hard work, you know, because you can't control it. Like all the social science around work, I'm sure you've read this, links work satisfaction to the sense of um, control that people have over the product of their work. So Marx built an entire ideology around the alienation of the worker. You know, in, a, in the Industrial Revolution, the ultimate cog in a machine, where somebody was literally a cog in a machine, or an assembly line, no connection to the end product, as opposed to a craftsman from the old world who made a table and met, you know, Susan and their family and, like, went over for dinner and ate at the table. And that's a totally different paradigm, right? Pastoring is really hard. Any kind of spiritual leadership is hard because people are way harder to work with than wood, you know? <laughs> and you can't carve them into your desired shape and nail them into your desired shape. And if they're annoying you, you can't just like saw off the part of them you don't like. <laughs> they have this pesky thing called agency and it's what makes human beings so staggering in their beauty, so depraved in their morality and so precious in their worth. 
And so it can be defeating because we can do all the right things. None of us do. But in a hypothetical scenario, we could do all the right things and it could still not work out great. And the grace side of it is we can make a ton of mistakes along the way, and that we will do, and God can still grow a soul. And we're all living proof of that. None of us have arrived, but all of us are arriving, and that's the gift. Thank you for having me. You're sitting at the right hand of Jim. <laughs> I just made that up. All right. Well, I was, I was tech you know, ticking off the boxes, you are an equal opportunity offender. I think, I think, I think, I think he's got everybody here in this talk. That's impressive. I know. <laughs> That's yep. not easy to do. I missed the memo on when you're a guest, only say the nice thing. <laughs> no, 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 it's a, but here's my first question though. Yeah. So you also talked about how we disagree with kindness. Like how do we, how, how do you, navigate that when someone you're in Christian fellowship with and you do disagree on any one of the things you touched on I mean how does that work in reality oh, I don't I'm not sure okay <laughs> um, the simple little paradigm that has stuck with me from one of my seminary professors he called it the four D's okay um, die for divide for debate for decide for um, meaning, what are the issues that I would literally die? If somebody put a gun to my head, mm -hmm. I would die for this. The yeah. resurrection of Jesus, the Trinity. Right. Um, what do I divide for? Like, we need to part ways. We cannot serve together. Mm -hmm. What do we debate for? Let's just argue this thing out till we're blue in the face. Yeah. And read books and counter arguments, point to counterpoint. And what's decide for? Like, you know, who are the 24 elders in Revelation 4? Mm -hmm. like, uh, make up your, what well, the last 10 chapters of Ezekiel? Yeah. Okay, you know, yeah. um, let's decide. And he said that, you know, most, peop most conservatives want to push too many issues up mm. into the divide for or die for when they're really decide for issues. Mm. And most progressives want put to push too many issues down into the, hey, you kind of make, you do you, mm -hmm. you know, make up your own mind. And so I think, I just am always trying to think through those categories. Yeah. What goes into the, the debate for category and what goes into the divide for category? Mm -hmm. And I am, it's so funny, people, whenever people call me young, I'm like, I'm not young, I'm 43. Mm -hmm. only, only in the modern church would that be considered young. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but I, I do think I'm reaching an age where I have lost patience for certain arms of the church because I'm pretty sure that they don't go anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I, so I'm not interested, and life is so short mm. and so precious. So I don't feel the need, like some people do, to stand up and scream at people I disagree with. Yeah. But I do feel that life is too short to give my energy to try and to convince people mm -hmm. to take Jesus seriously. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That might be way too black. No, no, no. I mean, I appreciate that. I mean, because it is, it is hard. We dance around quite a bit, and you took stands in several places and said, this I think is really important. And I'm never inviting you back. And you, you're never coming back. No, 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 I mean, I appreciate what that. What happens when you just say, serve what you're cooking, and you don't tell me what to talk about? <laughs> serve what you're cooking Sabbath as long as it's, rest, yes. I would have been down. <laughs> no. Well, you, here's something I've noticed about you uh, when you're on the podcast with me in conversations. You say more in a short period of time than just about anybody I know. Like I, I it's, just, it's just really dense. Mm. You're like when you eat those, that like a cake and it's just really dense. Is this like, is this a complicit here? As soon as I got right in the middle of that metaphor, it went south on me. I didn't, I didn't it's as a compliment. Like you're able to put a lot in a short space. Like I'm gonna have to re-look at the notes, probably watch this again. Like I listened to the podcast three times and then, it, like, and even the third time, I went, oh, he said that. It's that dense. I didn't know he I'm said sorry. that. I couldn't keep up. Uh, but obviously, one of the biggest things, I think, in what you had to say is you care about the church. Yeah. You even said the church is, the gates of hell will not prevail, right? The, the church is going to be around. Yeah. Formation, it's going to happen. It has to happen in the church. Um, and yet you're skeptical about the local church as it is being the place that this kind of formation can happen. Yeah. You also talked about re-architecture. So my question is, 
can an existing local church re-architecture in a way that this kind of formation can happen? Or must you start over, blow it up, do kind of what you're doing with Practicing the Way and go back to an entire, entire new paradigm model structure to do that? I mean, I, again, we're, we get into theory at this point, and I have a bunch of untested ideas that are not worth sharing. Um, and then I have some tested practices that I'm happy to share. So, um, I'm committed to the church. I'm probably way less enamored with the traditional American church than most pastors are, including, or especially including, the larger and more successful ones. Mm -hmm. um, just because I care so much about formation, probably to a fault, probably to where I don't think I've actually generated the heart um, of Jesus for lost people mm. that I think Jesus wants to generate in me. Mm -hmm. And um, so I probably am out of balance in my heart's emphasis and passion. And I'm sure Jesus is working on that in me. <laughs> um, I, so I think any step forward is a step in the right direction. Yeah. And I think there is a lot that can be done within the basic structures of a church, but it does require change, and you mm -hmm. have to go beyond, you know, I mean, broadly speaking, and you've done great work on this, the major problem with discipleship or sanctification, as it was called when I grew up, uh, is it's so Cartesian. It's, in, it's information-based. It's all right. based on enlightenment paradigms of human beings or information computers, and you put the right information. Most churches operate under the assumption that as a person's knowledge of the Bible, grows, their spiritual formation will grow with it. Right. And um, I just don't, <laughs> I've not experienced that <laughs> to be uh, the case. Yeah. <laughs> um, or at least early on it seems to correspond, but then it seems to stall out, you know? Right. And I just come, it's not a statement against the Bible, I came up in hardcore Bible churches. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm pretty sure that the problems I'm facing right now in my formation, uh, ways of being with my wife, the way I lose my temper with my children, mm -hmm. the way anxiety drives me as a father, the perfectionism, the, the seething kind of critical spirit that I can have. An exegetical study through Romans is probably not going to fix that stuff in me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's not a statement against Romans. I still, N.T. Wright, Romans in a week, if you've not heard that, it's just paradigm shifting, blew my theology away, it's un incredible. <laughs> but it didn't fix my problem with being a bad dad, <laughs> you know? And at right. this point, like, I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to live for my funeral, mm. and I, I, I want to have been a loving dad. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of stuff that Jesus still has to do in me for that. Yeah. So I think any step forward, sorry, I'm rambling, is a good step in the right direction. Yeah. I think a lot can be done in traditional churches. They just have to go far beyond the Cartesian sermon-based, and I believe in preaching very much. Um, it's, it does the V in Willard's Vim almost better than anything I've ever thought of, yeah. other than reading, but preaching reaches a way larger swath of the population right. than books do. Right. So I still believe in it, but if it ends there, it's so ineffective. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's a lot that churches can do, and that's what we're working on at Practicing the Way, is creating things for them to do. Um, but I do think we need almost like a fifth wave of even more innovative thinking, people that kind of rethink the church from the ground up. Mm -hmm. And there are people that have been doing that around kind of what would be called neo-monasticism. Um, uh, what's his face? The guy that did Operation World, um, Patrick. Yes, has that book, um, The Church is Bigger Than You Think. Mm. And that was really helpful for me, my interpretation of what he said which is not actually what he said, so don't hold it against him, <laughs> but is there are kind of three modalities of church down through church history, what he calls the congregational, which is what most of us think of as church. Mm -hmm. You come to a place on a Sunday morning. Um, the monastic, so I just got back from a retreat with a group of people at Mount Angel Abbey, Benedictine Abbey outside of Portland. I go there all the time, and it's more like a small town than because uh, they have a monastery, they have a guest house with 30 rooms, they have a Catholic seminary, they have a brewery, they have a bookstore and coffee shop, they have a park, they have a parish at the bottom of the hill, they have a farm, I mean, they have all this stuff. And it's, 
I don't think of it as a church, but it is. It's a community of people following Jesus in a place. But you don't just rock up and like join the Benedicts. Like you have to like go a three year process and take a vow of celibacy and give away all your possessions and wear a black robe all year long and the heat, like you're in. Yeah. But it's a community, it's a church. Yeah. And then the third would be the apostolic, which historically would be like the Celtic monasteries that were more like mission outposts. Yeah. In the modern world, it'd be maybe like the YWAM base in Kona. You know, you have 600 people that live there full time, 2,000, that, you right. know, but, but it's the opposite of a monastery. It's come and go. You're mm-hmm. supposed to be there for a short time and then you're sent. And basically, the Western, the congregational model has been so successful in the Western world, especially since the Industrial Revolution, because it works best for almost everybody's life to like pick a church that you can drive to in your automobile and attend that church and be in a small group if you have time that now when you hear church, almost the only imagination that people have is we're going to rent out a place. So I'm starting a church. People immediately think you're going to go rent someplace. You're going to have a sermon. You're going to have singing. You're going to have children's ministry. Not bad things. But I do think there needs to be more imagination around these other streams of the church. Mm -hmm. And people have been kind of quietly doing it for the last 20, 30 years. But almost nobody at a popular level, Francis Chan has been doing some house church stuff, which is a huge step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm really interested to see Mm -hmm. 10 years from now, what's that look like? Mm -hmm. And could there be popularized versions of that? Yeah. Wow. Well, you gave a very very theoretical, very theoretical, very very good answer that I'm going to have to rewatch again <laughs> to understand uh, everything that you said. Well, we're heading into a break and more workshops, but let's give thanks to John Mark Comer, even when he's under the weather, he does it. He comes and does it. <laughs>